Hello, it's Anthony Chadwick from the Webinar Vest, welcoming you to another one of our podcasts, Vet Chat. I'm very fortunate today to have Emma Keeble on the line. Emma is a wildlife vet based up in Edinburgh. Thank you so much for taking time to come on to the, the podcast, Emma. It's, it's an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me to, to chat with you today. Obviously, Emma, you, you t- perhaps tell us a little bit about yourself. You started at Bristol University training, didn't you? Which is, is a lovely part of the world to do all things wildlife anyway, isn't it? With Slimbridge and the Somerset levels. Um, well, certainly Bristol was a, a wonderful place to study. And I did a lot of caving while I was there as well. So um, managed to see some of the more rarer species of bats, such as the lesser horseshoe bat, um, which was amazing. But um, I guess I've always been interested in wildlife. I used to um, you know, go out with a friend who was doing a study trapping small mammals and, and help with that. And um, I also asked for a bat detector for one of my birthdays. So it's been something I've, I've always wanted to do. Um, and then at Bristol, um, I was really involved with uh, the one of the sort of exotic animal vet groups for wildlife. Um, and I ran the WWF group as well. So um, we had a lot of interesting people come and talk to us about wildlife, which again, made me really interested in wanting to pursue that really as a veterinary career. Did you ever come upon John Cooper at Bristol University? Um, I actually met John Cooper as a uh, a helper assistant in my very first vet practice and he was the key person who made me want to become an exotic vet actually he used to come once a month and we'd save all the really interesting cases for him Um, and at that time a lovely vet who also taught at Cambridge Vet School called Jilly Cooper was the main exotics person so they both were very um, formative really in in my sort of development of an interest in exotics so it goes even further back than vet school actually. John is is such an enthusiast and I was so fortunate he actually uh, gave me a signed copy of his book on gorilla medicine and conservation which is of course one of his huge passions isn't it yeah yeah, I think you're, you're very lucky to have that actually and, and John uh, and his his wife Margaret also were involved with the wildlife BSAVA manual that myself and Liz Mullineux were co-editors on mm. um, so it was nice to have them contribute their wealth of experience to that too it's a, it is a difficult journey though isn't it to make a career in in wildlife medicine you know you qualified from vet school obviously it's limited experiences to get into zoos but i know you worked for a while at edinburgh zoo perhaps tell us about that journey of how you managed to crack into that very elusive and exclusive field of wildlife medicine yeah um i i had an interest in being a zoo vet and i'd seen a lot of work experience as a student so that's a great opportunity uh, where you can really just get your foot into the door and get to know people um, we also had a single zoo lecture at bristol um, and after the lecture i rushed up to to get um the the lecturer's opinion on how best to become a zoo vet and he basically said don't bother um really it's very very hard so instead of getting disheartened by that experience i decided actually i was going to become a zoo vet and I was very lucky um, a new residency program had started at Edinburgh University at the small animal hospital um, and I applied for it and, and was very lucky to get the post so that involved working with Edinburgh Zoo working also at a local wildlife hospital um, as well as teaching vet students um, and also running a sort of first opinion or referral exotic pet practice so it was kind of a jack of all trades and I really enjoyed that it was an amazing experience and um, obviously learned a lot through that and was the wildlife hospital an SSPCA hospital yes it, it was actually it was um, quite local to us and we'd go once a week and they'd leave all the sort of interesting cases for us to see so there were several times I was driving back with a couple of swans in the back of the car it always used to make me laugh that people would just see these swan heads as they drove past me um so that was that was a very happy time actually and again learned a lot and created some really good um friendships and relationships with the local wildlife rehabilitators mm. as well did you, did you ever get stopped by the police asking why you were hijacking some of the queen's property <laughs> luckily no and, and thankfully also never involved in any accidents because i think that would have been quite a, a story to explain yes. no fantastic and i think we have a similar place the rspca 
hospital down in um, Stapley, mm -hmm. which I've been lucky enough to go down to with uh, Bev Panto was working there. And it's fascinating, even seals and so on can be rehabilitated for, from these places. What was perhaps your most unusual wildlife casualty that ended up at the hospital in, uh, in Scotland? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um... Well, we, we do actually seal quite a lot of seals and, and I, I know um, I, I personally really enjoy seal work. I know they're perhaps not as exotic as you might expect, but um, the last two summers actually I've been involved in seal rescue operations. I've been on the beach with family and uh, uh, baby seals come come um, onto the shore um, and basically is emaciated and thin and very weak and so I've been involved actually hands-on with with quite a few of those um, and they're always such a delight really I suppose the commons are a lot more uh, quiet and placid uh, than the grey seal pups that can be quite have quite an attitude but I quite like that as well it, mm. cha it makes it challenging to handle yeah. them and obviously uh, once they're feeling better you you don't get as much opportunities to get hands-on but I think the seals it's a it's a big mammal it's something that we we see occasionally don't be popping up in the water but to actually have it um brought into you and hands-on is is quite a specialist thing and you're, you're right there are three wildlife hospitals for the rspca and i actually worked in one of those um for for two years as a veterinary wildlife intern at west hatch which again was an amazing experience mm. and the, of course just going back the the seals as you say can give you a quite nasty nip can't they <laughs> Yes, you do have to be really careful and know what you're doing. But um, people who are very experienced handling can literally just use a thin towel um, over the heads to, to sort of calm them. And then it's yeah. a quick jump onto the seal to, to restrain it. But yeah. the little common seals are very easy to handle. They, they tend to be less bitey. So you obviously did the intern residency at Edinburgh University. Did that then translate into a full time job at Edinburgh Zoo? Was that the sort of next part of the journey or did you go to Hatch End before the zoo? So um, West Hatch was actually for a couple of years. Um, I was in practice for a couple of years and then I went to West Hatch, the wildlife hospital. And it yeah. was from that that I then went up to um, Edinburgh Zoo after a brief period again back in practice. So um, I was 10 years at the zoo and initially was a, a resident and then was very fortunate to be suddenly promoted to head of service when uh, one of my colleagues went off on maternity leave um, and have stayed since then. I, I really find it a, a great job. Um, Edinburgh Zoo now have their own um, vets who, who deal with their cases, um, but we do still occasionally get involved with them, um, particularly if they're wanting things like advanced imaging and wanting to bring an animal in to get an MRI or CT scan done. Um, we, we have so many different requests actually at Edinburgh for an incredible different um, number of species. We, we had this week some work being done with a, a shark actually as well. So, you know, it really can can be anything that we yes. see. Um, <clears throat> One of, one of my worst sort of cases actually was a scorpion that came on a train down from Aberdeen in a box. And the reason I say it's worse just because I'm not particularly keen on scorpions. <laughs> um, so I had to had to uh, steal myself and treat this, yeah. this animal. Um, and actually it turned out it had a little abscess on its back and we managed to treat it by antibiotics in its food uh, and it did really well. So that, that's good, but it really can be anything that's coming through the door um, at, the, at the vet school. I think it's interesting sometimes I remember being a very young graduate as in first couple of months and I got a guinea pig coming in that just didn't look well and as I sort of examined it properly I realized it had a swollen abdomen I then listened to its heart found out that it had you know a heart murmur and sometimes when you see a, a, a funny an unusual species you can kind of forget that actually it is all about first principles isn't it that we can look at many of these animals just by going back to first principles I, I i'm not quite so sure how i would listen to a scorpion's heart but uh you know there is there is limitations but there's so much that we can do and of course i know john used to love bringing in the african giant land snails into liverpool all of these interesting stick insects and so on it, it's it's uh, fascinating but you you can just go back to first principles and that will get you certainly a distance into the case won't it obviously the specialist knowledge is is important as well 
I, I think you're absolutely right. And that's what we're really trying to teach um, our students at Edinburgh. I, I feel um, actually generally students have been very well taught about those sort of basic principles and not to panic, just to go back to square one you know, do as much of a clinical examination as you feel you can safely um, and then use your, your basic principles to work the case up. And there are also a lot of um, helpful organisations or um, such mm. as British Veterinary Zoological Society that you can join if you're seeing a lot of exotic pets. Um, and there's usually always someone you can pick up the phone to or email to ask for advice. And we get a lot of advice calls from vets at Edinburgh. But, you know, we, we try and take time to answer all of them because it can be quite daunting in practice. But yeah, absolutely. With the, with the scorpion, it had a lump on its back. So we aspirated it and looked at it under microscope and it had an abscess. So, you know, um, mm even though it seems a bit daunting when it's presented to you at first it, it is easy um, to apply first principles and if you get to a point where you're really not happy then obviously ask for help i have to ask the question i presume that the scorpion was anesthetized before it was examined uh, yes, and from what I can remember, it, it was. So that's another whole uh, difficulty, isn't it, that you're encountering? But we also have some wonderful manuals, you know, the BSA VA mm. Manual of Exotic Pets. I think that was always my go-to in practice, yeah. and it's been updated quite recently. So that's a really helpful thing to have, um, and you'll get all the basic sort of information that you need there. And we're getting that from the the author's mouth as well, so it must be good. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I've, I've certainly contributed to it over the years. I, I don't yeah. think I'm in the, the most latest version, but uh, uh, there are many other books as well, you know, yeah. as you're aware of BSAVA manuals on exotics that can be useful too. So I, I have to ask, you know, the the, um, the scorpion got better, so presumably there was, there was no sting in the tail with that case then. I couldn't resist that, Emma, sorry. <laughs> I like I it. I apologise, apologise. <laughs> oh, excellent. No. Move, moving on to uh, obviously the wildlife uh, medicine and I think there's possibly a couple of things that I'd like to talk about first of all obviously avian flu is is still around what, what is your sort of take on on that at the moment yeah I mean it has been a real worry hasn't it this year in 2022 in January when we had the first sort of cases identified in wildlife and there's some really good um, government websites that will give you all the latest information on, on where we are with avian flu but um, I think we often overlook the importance of wildlife as sentinels for these sorts of diseases um, and actually it's really important for us to um, perform sort of proper post-mortems on any wild birds that are dying unexpectedly or with signs that are suspicious of avian flu um, and I think we're all very much now aware aren't we having been through the COVID pandemic of how quickly a disease can potentially spread um, into a new host and then become uh, quite a significant worldwide issue. So avian flu is definitely one to watch that it, there are concerns and there has been one case, I believe, so far in, in a, um, a human, uh, mm. a, a gentleman called Mr. Gosling who kept ducks in his mm. house. So um, this is something I guess we need to just be very much aware of um, and, and hopefully as vets, I think we are actually very good at applying sort of general principles to both wildlife and pet animals um, and, mm. and disease control and, and zoonotic disease is something we're very aware of as well. I think sometimes we have that holistic approach that as medicine has specialised so much and you might have a doctor who looks at shoulders, you know, if you ask him about avian flu, that would probably be a difficult conversation, whereas obviously we do specialise, but but there is still that sort of holistic looking at the whole picture, isn't it? And yeah. and the, the whole concept of One Health in some ways has, has been a lot coming from the veterinary side. So, yeah, I yeah, know I absolutely agree. And of course, as you said, COVID came from um, pangolins or bats or whatever. Um, we're now looking also at, uh, at monkeypox, which is again uh rearing its ugly head obviously not as serious as as covid but still a concern and i know there was uh 
I think it was prairie dogs that were involved in America, weren't they, in that particular disease? Yeah, exactly. And and um, I was quite surprised when that was first really hitting the news that there wasn't any mention of any sort of um, reservoir for this. And obviously they were more concerned about human to human contact, but certainly small rodents can carry it. And um, again, it's something we need to be very much aware of. Um, yeah. I think this also came through actually going back to COVID with the pet ferret situation, because we um, quite quickly identified that ferrets could potentially get COVID as well and again there was really clear advice on the government website about what to do if you had a pet ferret and were concerned about this so you know these sorts of issues are much more um, what's the word we, we, we're sort of much more aware of the situation and how things can prog progress very quickly and I think actually that's a very positive thing that's come out of COVID and like you say us, us vets tended to always be aware of the potential for zoonosis and you know wear gloves and protective um, clothing and masks mm. and so forth so it wasn't too much of a um, transition uh, for us but I think it has really uh, opened the medical work the human medical world up to to realizing that the it's not just one individual thing there's like you say a one health that we need to be more holistic in our approach as well. I have to finish with perhaps one of my favorite uh, little species that I, I'm lucky enough to see quite regularly in my garden which is is the hedgehog Presumably at uh, Edinburgh and during your career, you've seen a fair number of injured and diseased hedgehogs in your time. Perhaps uh, share a little bit about what, what's perhaps a, a couple of tips for people to think about. One of my ones is always they're so difficult to examine once they roll up, aren't they? Do they just need to be anaesthetized pretty much all the time to do a, a decent examination on them? Um, that's a really good question, actually. It depends on on how huffy the hedgehog is, really. Um, you can gently coax them to come out. And my favourite way is by gently just stroking the spines from, from head to tail um, and rocking them gently side to side. So they tend to put their feet down if you do that. And you can get a little bit of a look at the nose and eyes and uh, certainly at the limbs as well to an extent. Mm. But the proper exam is going to be under a general anaesthetic. Um, and actually, one of the really positive things with that is if they're covered in fleas, uh, usually the general anaesthetic will also anaesthetize those as well and they'll all drop off um, so we use a gaseous induction pre-oxygenating and then sevofluoronize or whatever you have in a in a chamber um, but obviously be aware that those fleas will, will wake up as soon as they they are out of that chamber so we usually uh, put the hedgehog onto a little face mask to to continue with the anaesthetic and then try and spray or, or you know release the flea somewhere yes. else <laughs> Oh, but they are the most amazing, wonderful animals, but they tend to get into such terrible predicaments of all the, the wildlife that we see. They they fall down holes, they get stuck in netting, um, you know, they, they go down sort of pipes and can't reverse, mm. um, strimmer injuries, yeah. bonfire injuries, you know, a lot of these things seem to befall the little friendly hedgehog. Um, and there have been real concerns about decline in population numbers over the last few years. Mm. I was reading an article recently in the BBC Wildlife which is saying that there is a little bit of a resurgence but it's more in the urban areas in the rural areas they still struggle and of course one of their chief predators is is the badger mm -hmm. isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, certainly badgers have been in the news a lot fairly recently they always seem to be in the news mm -hmm. and we do have large um, populations of them certainly in in the south of the country um but i think also with the, the hedgehogs um there is the feeling that this over urbanization of, of the countryside has actually led to partly led to decline mm. and uh, increase in roads you know road traffic accidents are also yeah. very common yeah. um, and there are little things that i think we should be doing uh, that can help these these animals and so um you know having a hedgehog house in your garden making a little hole in your fence so that hedgehogs can enter your garden easily it only really needs to be the size of a yeah. cd disc um, and and that can give them greater access to these wonderful gardens and also allowing wild plants to grow so we have you know slugs and snails and not using uh, any of the the compounds to remove those at all um, and those little things i think should really help i also put the uh, hedgehog pellets out and some I mean, they love mealworms. I know I read stuff which says, you know, you really shouldn't give mealworms. What, what's your kind of take on on the mealworms situation? Because it does look like crack cocaine for them in fairness. They, they, they devour them. 
they love them don't they um it's like anything it's like if you sat and ate cream cakes all day you'd, you'd get overweight yeah. i mean they are high fat they're low in calcium um you know and, and certain of the vitamins so they're not they're not an ideal they're not a complete diet um but if you've got an ailing animal or a thin animal an animal that's really struggling to find food then it is a wonderful way to encourage them to come into the garden so i think it swings and roundabouts if that is literally all they're eating then i would be worried yeah. but hopefully they will be going off and foraging elsewhere and perhaps limiting the amount you actually give them each night might be a good idea and and cat food is often uh, appreciated by them as well isn't it absolutely yeah and perhaps dry cat food over wet cat food because we do see a lot of dental disease in pet um, in pet hedgehogs but also in the wildlife ones that are yeah. overwintered um so trying to reduce the risk of sort of you know plant build up and um you know that that is really important by giving sort of a dry hard food instead of wet wet food regularly although they do like that as well i have to say i can almost time them now to when they'll come into the garden and and um it's a lot more entertaining than love island uh, not that i've watched love island but i'm i i i had a friend around and as she was leaving i said just hold on before we open the door we'll do it quietly see if there's hedgehogs in the garden as i opened it one hedgehog was running up the path and the other one behind it and i was very fortunate um, to see should we say some sexual activity which uh, i believe is is it quite a rare thing uh, to do you know i know the joke is how do yes. hedgehogs make love carefully <laughs> I, I got a i got a graphic description of it uh, when they were on my um on my path in my garden uh-huh it, it is quite um a noisy affair and as you yes. say quite a difficult affair as well um but i i, I love that analogy to to love island i think <laughs> um seeing the, the the animals that are actually in your own garden is is wonderful um but yeah i mean we have a lot where i live and and we're sort of out in the countryside and had the same same experience at sort of four in the morning that the, there were amorous events happening at the yeah. end of our drive um and it's these little things just noticing you know and encouraging hedgehogs into your garden is such a lovely thing to do i i talk a lot about uh, conservation and sustainability but or as you say it's all holistic it all dovetails together because we now talk a lot about mental health and there's no doubt for me that you know i i have joy when I go out to bird watch or to watch the hedgehogs in my garden instead of watching the news or whatever, mm. uh, it can be so therapeutic as well, can't it? Absolutely. And and I think we've all spent a lot more time on our gardens in the last few years. So yes. um, and enjoyed sort of um, uh, making them a nice place for us to relax in. And part of that is making a wildlife area, encouraging wildlife into your garden, um, perhaps having bird feeders up as well. And um, I think I think it's a lovely thing. And there's a lot of really good organisations you can get in contact with, you know, to, to encourage that and, you know, bat organizations and the hedgehog organizations as well emma it's been great to speak to you thank you for all that you do for the uh nation's wildlife it's uh it's such an important area obviously some of them are struggling like the hedgehogs so it's great that we've we've got that ability to be able to take them to our practices i know how much great work practices do i did it myself when i had a practice um so so thank you for everything that you do to teach us as gps how to look after hedgehogs seals and all manner of things so thank you so much thank you it's been lovely chatting with you thanks emma take care bye-bye bye.